he has to sort of thread a needle um, in, a, in a very narrow hole, or I don't know how this threading the needle analogy works. This video is about the sixth and final of Descartes' meditations. There are two major things that happen in this meditation. The first is that Descartes finally gets around to proving that the external physical world, the world of tables and chairs and mountains and molecules, all that stuff outside of his own mind, he proves that that exists. And then the other thing he does is he offers two arguments for the distinctness of the mind and the body. Descartes is what we will call a dualist. Dualism is specifically, as we're using the term here, a theory about the nature of the human mind. The idea is that there's two. There's two things, dual. There's the mind and the body. This is what Descartes thinks. And there are two separate kinds of stuff. There's the physical stuff and the mental stuff, and they're different. So we get two arguments for Descartes' version of dualism in Meditation 6. So before we get to all that, let's just really, really quickly recap what happened in the first five meditations. In Meditation 1, Descartes wipes away all of his beliefs. He doubts everything. In Meditation 2, he proves that he necessarily exists and that he's a thinking thing. In Meditation 3, he proves the existence of God. That was the weird proof with like formal reality and objective reality. In Meditation 4, he runs into a problem the problem of error, that's a problem for the conclusion from Meditation 3, the conclusion that God exists. He solves that problem, or at least thinks he does, in Meditation 4. Then in Meditation 5, he offers another proof for the existence of God, that was the ontological proof. So now, here we are at the beginning of Meditation 6, Descartes knows for certain that he exists, that he's a thinking thing, that he has all of these thoughts, and that God exists. But he doesn't yet know that there's a physical world. Any physical world that includes his own body with his hands and his eyes and his ears and his feet. He, doesn't, he hasn't proved that that exists or that there are any mountains or buildings or rooms or anything like that. Here's what he says to prove that those things exist. This happens on page 8079. For God has given me no faculty at all for recognizing any such source for these ideas. He means a source other than the physical world for all of his ideas of objects in the physical world. On the contrary, he has given me a great propensity to believe that they are produced by corporeal things. Corporeal just means having a corpse or a body. So physical, ordinary material objects like uh, stones and mountains and, and hands and feet and tables and chairs. So I do not see how God could be understood to be anything but a deceiver if the ideas were transmitted from a source other than corporeal things. It follows that corporeal things exist. They may not all exist in a way that exactly corresponds with my sensory grasp of them, for in many cases the grasp of the senses is very obscure and confused. Okay, in that short passage, Descartes proves that the physical world exists. Here's what's going on. He has to sort of thread a needle um, in, a, in a very narrow hole, or I don't know how this threading the needle analogy works, but the point is that on the one hand, he needs to say that God is not a deceiver. But on the other hand, he needs to accommodate the fact that he makes mistakes, and he needs to prove that the physical world exists. But he knows that he can't prove that everything that he thinks about the physical world is accurate because there's lots of things that he thinks about the physical world that definitely aren't accurate. Like he often has mistaken beliefs about, you know, objects around him and then it turns out he was wrong. Things weren't the way that they seemed from afar. So he's got, he's got all of these balls that he's trying to juggle. And he solves this problem or he juggles all of these considerations with the idea of double checking. So there are some things that you might be inclined to believe, but then you can double check to see if you really should believe those things. Let's say that I seem to see a cat over there. Seems like there's a cat. But is there, is there really a cat, right? 
I can double check. There's, there's all sorts of ways. So it seems like I'm seeing a cat, but I can check by asking another person who's next to me, hey, uh, do you see a cat over there? I want to know if I'm hallucinating, if there's really a cat or not, right? Or maybe the light is playing tricks on me or something like that. So I ask another person, I double check that there's a cat. Or I walk over to the cat and I reach out with my hand. Because if I'm having a visual hallucination, then when I reach out with my hand, I won't feel anything because there isn't actually a cat there. So I double check by using another one of my sense modalities, right? I'm checking my vision by using the sense of touch. Or even I could triple check by then also smelling to see if there's a cat there. Even you notice when I originally put forward the suggestion that I was like, you know, seeing a cat or whatever, I did this thing with my head. You know, I was like, I was like this. I was like, hey, is there a cat there? What am I doing with my head there? Remember that? We do this all the time when we see something unusual. What we're doing is we're getting another perspective on the object, right? I'm, I, have, I have one angle on this supposed cat that I'm supposedly seeing, and then I move my head. Whoop! And now I'm at another angle. And so if it was the angle that was misleading me, I've now double checked by moving my head a little bit. This is something that we do automatically all the time. We double check what we're inclined to believe. So Descartes thinks that it's compatible with God's existence that sometimes he has mistaken inclinations as long as he can double check, right? If he's inclined to believe that there's a cat there, and he doesn't bother double checking, and then he falsely believes that there's a cat when there really isn't, right, because he's having a hallucination, or because the light is playing tricks on him or something like that, well, in that case, he didn't double check, so it's his fault. It doesn't make God a deceiver. But then, there are other things that he's inclined to believe, like uh, the phrase that he uses is that he has a great propensity to believe those things. There are some things that he very naturally wants to believe, he's inclined to believe them, but that there's absolutely no way of him double checking. Like the general claim that there's a physical world at all. The natural thing to think that all human beings think, right, automatically by default, is that there is a physical reality. That the ideas that one has in one's mind of, you know, a hand, come into your mind because of an actual physical corporeal hand in the world. There's the physical hand and, and the idea gets into your mind from the, from the hand itself. That's what we're naturally inclined to believe. How could we double check that? We have no way of double checking the general claim that the physical world exists at all. We can't just get another angle on it. There's no way to double check. So, if that inclination, the inclination to believe in the physical corporeal world, if that inclination were misleading, if there wasn't a physical world, we, we would just sort of be trapped into that belief with no way to check. And if we were trapped into a false belief with no way of double checking, well then God definitely would be a deceiver. So Descartes concludes, because he thinks he knows that God exists and God isn't a deceiver, it has to be the case that the physical world exists. Because otherwise, if the physical world didn't exist, then his inclination to believe in the physical world would be a deceptive one and God would be a deceiver, but God isn't, so the physical world must be there. That's the proof for the existence of the physical world. I'm gonna reread the passage that I just read before so you can see that I'm not just making this up, that that's what's in the text. For God has given me no faculty at all for recognizing any such source for these ideas. On the contrary, he has given me a great propensity to believe that they are produced by corporeal things. That is, he has an inclination to believe that the ideas in his mind of physical things actually come from physical things. That's what he's inclined to believe. He has this great propensity, and he has no way of double-checking. So I do not see how God could be understood to be anything but a deceiver if the ideas were transmitted from a source other than corporeal things. So if these ideas in my mind of physical things didn't come from physical things, then God would be a deceiver. It follows that corporeal things exist. Therefore, corporeal things exist because otherwise God would be a deceiver and God isn't a deceiver. That's the proof 
for the existence of physical objects in the world. What about dualism? The second thing that happens in Meditation 6 is that we get two arguments for the claim that the mind and the body are different things. One of them is the conceivability argument. That argument happens mostly on page AT78. And then there's the divisibility argument. The divisibility argument happens mostly on page AT86. You'll notice actually that because uh, the conceivability argument happens at this point, it actually comes before the proof for the existence of the physical world. Anyway, this is an introduction to philosophy course, so we're not going to talk about the conceivability argument because it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, when I get around to teaching an upper level course uh, focused more, you know, directly on the meditations, we'll go through the conceivability argument. But for now, the divisibility argument, this one, is enough to occupy us. Before we get started, though, let's just say something about how this argument might fail. Descartes, at this point in the meditations, right, um, before the divisibility argument, but after the proof for the existence of the physical world, Descartes has proven that he has a mind. That was back in Meditation 2. And now, in Meditation 6, he's proven that he has a body. His body might not be exactly the way he always thinks it is, but there's a physical world and he has some sort of body, he thinks. It could turn out, of course, that these two things are just one thing, right? It sometimes happens that we think there's two things and they just turn out to be one. Like, for example, you've got Clark Kent and Superman. Clark Kent is a reporter at the Daily Planet newspaper or whatever. Superman is an alien uh, from Krypton. I know that. Um, and he can fly uh, and shoot lasers out of his eyes, and he's really strong, uh, and so on. Oh, and he has x-ray vision? That too, I think? Wait, so he can shoot lasers out of his eyes and he has x-ray vision? Okay. Uh, anyway, it turns out that these two dudes are the same dude. There's just one dude. You might think that you might associate some characteristics with Clark, like being nerdy and working as a newspaper reporter, and he is nerdy, and he does work at a newspaper reporter. And then the qualities of like being able to fly, that's the qualities of Superman, but there's really just one guy. He's a nerdy guy who can fly. One dude. It could turn out, right, that the mind and the body are really just one thing. Descartes associates the mind with thought. He thinks that thought is the essential characteristic of the mind, and he thinks that the essential characteristic of the body is what he calls extension. Extension was a, a standard philosophical term um, in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe when Descartes was writing. Um, extension just means the characteristic of being stretched out in space. You're extended, extended, stretched out. You're extended in space if you take up space. You have height and depth and width, right? You have all the three dimensions. That's extension. There are two things, and they each have a characteristic property, right? But it could turn out, right, that they were just the same thing, that there's really just one thing, just like there's really one guy, Clark Kent, Superman, just one dude. Now, because Descartes is a dualist, Descartes thinks, no, there's not just one thing. The mind and the body are two different kinds of stuff. And the divisibility argument is the argument that seems to show that. We're going to read the argument right now. The first observation I make at this point is that there is a great difference between the mind and the body, inasmuch as the body is, by its very nature, always divisible, while the mind is utterly indivisible. Okay, that's the start of the proof. There's a difference between these two things. The mind is indivisible, cannot be divided, cannot be separated out into parts, and the body is divisible, always divisible, like you can always chop body up into smaller parts. The way that this proof is going to work is that, you know, you prove that there's two incompatible properties. One thing can't be both indivisible and always divisible. It would be like, let's say you knew that Clark Kent was, you know, five foot, six inches tall, and you knew that Superman was 
six two. They can't be the same dude if they're different heights. Because you can't be five six and six two. You're only one. You're either this height or this height. Those or some height in between or some height greater, but you can't be at two mutually incompatible heights, right? So if it turned out, if you if you were trying to figure out you were like, huh. Are Superman and Clark Kent the same dude? You'd be like, I've never seen them at the same place. They both have dark hair. Uh, one of them wears glasses, the other one doesn't. But then you'd be like, no, you could just take off glasses. But you can't take off height. So if you found out that Clark Kent was 5'6 and that Superman was 6'2, then you'd know, oh, it turns out they're not the same. That's what Descartes is trying to do with the divisibility argument when it comes to the mind and the body. He's saying, oh look, this thing is indivisible and this thing is divisible, so they can't be the same thing. For when I consider the mind, or myself, insofar as I am merely a thinking thing, I am unable to distinguish any parts within myself. I understand myself to be something quite single and complete. This is backing up the claim that the mind is indivisible. It doesn't have parts. It's just one simple thing. Simple means not made up of parts. Although the whole mind seems to be united to the whole body, I recognize that if a foot or arm or any other part of the body is cut off, nothing has thereby been taken away from the mind. Okay, so in that sentence, Descartes, you know, considers a possible objection. The, the thought is like, well, no, look, the mind is sort of like spread out over the whole body, right? And so the mind has parts. The mind has its foot part, just like the body has its foot part. No, Descartes says, because if you chop off someone's foot, then you've taken away some of their body. But you haven't taken away any of their mind, right? It's not like part of their mind goes away. So it seems like when you divide some of the body, you don't divide the mind. The mind isn't spread out over the body, although it seems that way, that's, that's just not true, Descartes says. As for the faculties of willing, of understanding, of sensory perception, and so on, these cannot be termed parts of the mind, since it is one and the same mind that wills and understands and has sensory perceptions. Okay, in this sentence, Descartes is considering another possible objection, right? You might object to the claim that the mind is indivisible by saying, what do you mean the mind is indivisible? It has different faculties. It has, you know, the part of the mind that, that senses things in the world. And then it has the part of the mind that understands and the part of the mind that wills or whatever. And Descartes is saying, no, no, no. Strictly speaking, those aren't parts of the mind. Those are just things that the mind does. It understands things or it senses things. It's just still one singular indivisible mind and it just, it just does different things at different times. By contrast, there is no corporeal or extended thing that I can think of which in my thought I cannot easily divide into parts. And this very fact makes me understand that it is divisible. Okay, so in that sentence he moves on to the claim that body is divisible. Descartes thinks that you can always take some bit of physical matter and chop it up into smaller pieces. Descartes, writing in the 17th century, was what was called a corpuscularian. The corpuscularians were a group of scientists at the time. Famously, uh, it included Hobbes and Locke and Newton and Boyle, that's Isaac Newton. These were folks that were rejecting Aristotle's uh, four elements that make up the universe, earth, wind, fire, and water, they instead thought that physical matter was made up of corpuscles, little particles, right? And corpuscularianism was different from another theory that was circulating at the time called atomism. Atomism was the idea that, well, things were made up of particles, sure, but those particles were indivisible little particles. The corpuscularians thought that, no, you can, you can, you can get into those little, those little basic particles that make up everything and you can change features of them and stuff like that. And so it was the corpuscularians like Newton who were alchemists. They were trying to change other metals like iron or whatever into gold. Sort of as a side note, there were different kinds of corpuscularians. There were the ones that thought that all of the particles that make up the universe um, 
you know, were sort of bopping around and bouncing into one another and all that sort of thing, but there was empty space sometimes in between them. Maybe modern physics is this kind of corpuscularian, but Descartes was the kind that thought that all the corpuscles, all the particles were packed in maximally tight up against one another and there was no such thing as a vacuum. There was no empty space whatsoever. So if one of the particles sort of moved out of the way, then another one immediately squeezed in to replace its, you know, the, 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 what would otherwise be empty space left by the first particle moving. This is in stark contrast to the view that we have today uh, given to us by modern physics, whereby almost everything in the universe is empty space. You know this, right, that according to physics, everything or basically everything is empty space. Like everything is made up of atoms, right? And atoms have a nucleus. And then in the nucleus, that's where the protons and the neutrons are. And then there's the, the electrons. But the, and the atoms, of course, you know, they'll sometimes get really close and they'll bond. Uh, and that's when they share electrons. But the electrons are still orbiting around the, the nucleus or whatever. But the atom is almost all empty space. Like take a hydrogen atom for example, right? Say that you, a hydrogen atom, um, you know, is the simplest atom. It's just got one proton in the middle and then it's got one electron going around it, right? Say you took a hydrogen atom and you blew up the nucleus so that it was this big. There, that's the proton. That's the nucleus of the hydrogen atom. Okay, where should I draw the electron? Like how far away do I have to go before I draw the electron? The answer is two miles. If the nucleus is this big, then the electron goes two miles away. For every, you know, let's say foot of nucleus, you have a two mile gap and then you have an electron. Atoms are almost entirely empty space. And so that means everything, according to modern physics, is almost entirely empty space. This marker is empty space, basically. And every table, every solid surface, all this stuff is empty space. That's not the way it looks, but according to physics, that's the way it is. Anyway, uh, Descartes was the kind of corpuscularian who thought that um, there were no vacuums, everything was packed in maximally tight, there was no empty space at all. And the important part for us is that Descartes thinks that you could always separate out physical matter into parts. You could always divide it, right? Even if you got down to a corpuscle you know, a, a particle that you couldn't physically rip apart, you could still, you know, mentally divide it into like the left half and the right half. And those are, those are parts and you're still dividing in a certain sense of dividing. This one argument would be enough to show me that the mind is completely different from the body, even if I did not already know as much from other considerations. Okay, that sentence is just the sentence where he says, okay, I'm done. I've concluded that dualism is true, that the mind is distinct from the body and you know, this argument works all on its own, the divisibility argument, even if I hadn't already given this other argument for the same conclusion, you know, several pages earlier. Why does it matter that the mind and the body are distinct? Like, why do we care? Well, here's the big reason to care. And then because of this, we're gonna spend the entire rest of the semester focusing on whether dualism is true or whether the alternative view, physicalism, that the mind is part of the body, um, whether that view is true. It matters because this is the only way that human beings can survive their bodily death. We don't typically think about it like this, but most people on the planet think that they themselves and that everyone around them is immortal, right? Immortal means that you can't die. So if you are an adherent to one of the major monotheistic religions, you think, that you have like a soul that goes somewhere when your body dies, right? So your heart stops beating and all the electrical signals in your brain cease. And then what happens is your soul, that is your mind, your consciousness, your memories, all that sort of stuff, they, they're not physical stuff. They go off to heaven or to hell or whatever, right? They go to meet judgment or something like that. Most people on the planet think that something like this happens. If that is true, then we don't really die, not in the interesting sense. You, you lose your, like, your vessel, you know, the, the machine that you're moving around in. But you yourself, your thoughts, your consciousness, your mind, 
that goes somewhere else and it never dies. It goes to live somewhere for eternity. So in the interesting, important, fundamental sense, you are immortal, if all of those people are right. Anyway, that view is only really possible if you think that the mind is not itself some physical stuff. The mind has to be a separate, different thing from the body in order to live on forever after your body dies. Okay, there's one last thing that we need to take out of meditation six before we can be done with the meditations and move on with the rest of the course, and that's this. Descartes is not just any old dualist. He's what's called an interactionist dualist. The idea is that the mind and the body are distinct, that's the dual part of dualism, but that they interact causally. Stuff happening in the mind can cause stuff to happen in the body, and stuff happening in the body can cause stuff to happen in the mind. That's Descartes' view. He's an interactionist dualist, the kind of dualist that thinks that the body and mind interact with one another. Here's where he makes this claim. It happens on AT86. My next observation is that the mind is not immediately affected by all parts of the body, but only by the brain, or perhaps just by one small part of the brain, namely the part which is said to contain the common sense. He definitely thinks that they causally interact, uh, but he doesn't think that the mind directly interacts with like your hand, for example, like when your mind has a sensation of, of touch from your hand. Um, it's not like the mind is right up there with the hand, rather what happens, Descartes thinks, and if dualism is right, then it seems like Descartes is right, that there's a signal sent from your hand up your arm to your spine and then into your brain, and then there's a part of your brain, the part that contains the common sense part of your brain. In another work, he points out that he thinks that this is the pineal gland. That's a, that's a gland, that's a part of your brain. He thinks that's where the mind or the soul gets the signal from the hand, and that's also where it sends a signal back to the hand to, to do things like move around. Every time this part of the brain is in a given state, it presents the same signals to the mind, even though the other parts of the body may be in a different condition at the time. The idea there is just that, you know, let's say I have the sensation of like touching this glass, right? One way for that to happen, I get that, how does that sensation get into my mind? Well, one way, Descartes thinks, is for a signal to go from my hand, up my arm, into the spine, into the pineal gland, and then from the pineal gland it goes into my mind, wherever that is. It's not, it's not really anywhere in space. Um, it's not extended, for sure. Uh, so that's one way, is that, it, is that the signal goes from my hand to the pineal gland and then into the mind. But Descartes thinks that it's also possible for that signal to originate more locally, that is closer to the pineal gland. Like, let's say I don't touch the glass but that some wire in my brain gets tripped anyway, and the signal gets into my pine pineal gland even though I don't touch anything. The signal didn't start in my hand, it started somewhere closer, but if the same signal gets into the pineal gland, then that same signal gets sent to the mind, and then in the mind I have the feeling or the sensation of touching the glass even if I don't. That's what he was saying in that, in that last sentence. Okay, that's it. We're done with the meditations.